This video was sponsored by Skillshare. Ho ho ho, it's Christmas time, and there's not a better time than now to review David Tennant's first story. Wow, I cannot believe it's taken me over six years of reviewing this show to finally get around to reviewing The Christmas Invasion. The Christmas special that started a 12 year long tradition of having a Doctor Who episode air on Christmas Day. If you've been watching my channel for a while now, you will know Christmas specials aren't exactly my cup of tea. This episode is no exception, so today I will be telling you whether the very first Christmas special sucked or not. You know what else? has sucked 2020. To make indoor existence more bearable, my partner and I have filled our home with plants. I've even got one sitting right next to me whilst recording this script. Hi Zachary, how are you doing today? I think Christopher Griffin's class Plants at Home, Uplift Your Spirit and Your Space over on Skillshare does a great job of explaining how you can start up your own little collection of plants. Skillshare is a website that offers thousands of inspiring classes for creative and curious people. If you know somebody that writes, films, designs, photographs, or just needs a hobby, a Skillshare subscription would make for a great Christmas gift. An annual subscription works out at £7 a month, which is great when you consider how they have no adverts and are continually launching new premium classes. Head on down to my link in the description because the first 1,000 of you to use my link will get a free trial of Skillshare Premium membership. Now, without further ado, let's get on with the review. The Christmas Invasion begins with a reassurance that the show isn't changing head to toe. This was done by adapting the opening sequence of the episode Rose, changing the alarm clock to a bauble instead. This set up the episode with efficiency and familiarity. Jackie still misses Rose and isn't even certain her daughter will be coming home this year. The metallic wheezing and clumsy appearance of the TARDIS shows a crash landing as opposed to a materialisation. You got the sense of character change just from the way the protagonist Protagonist crashed onto the scene. Where it landed would be the last place this incarnation of the Doctor would stand before stumbling into the TARDIS and regenerating in the end of time. The Doctor wound up in a bedroom where Jackie's dramatics took centre stage. What do you mean both? Well, he's got two hearts. Oh, don't be stupid. Well, he has. Anything else he's got to her. God, she is such a great character. The inclusion of Mickey and Jackie made this more than just a Christmas episode for the aesthetic's sake. That warm familiarity and the idea of a family coming together made it truly feel like Christmas. The pair's shared confusion about the regeneration allowed younger and newer audience members to empathise with this bizarre situation that's been thrown in front of them. This is what Harbo Holmes has called the bridging of the series series, something that the show had been utilising in these Christmas slots right up until 2017. Seeing the Harriet Jones interview on TV allowed for a brief reminder that these one year out of sync Brits have witnessed alien life in the past and are willing to seek the stars to find more. Unfortunately, it's told through those tedious film the TV sections that you guys know I love to complain about. I was more forgiving of the dated CGI rendering of the Guinevere spacecraft because I artists' impressions are something commonly seen on the news anyway. Mickey and Rose then went shopping and were attacked by robot trumpeteers. This was one of those classic New Who moments in the show that made it so defining. They don't even serve that big of a function, but just feel so iconic to me. It was great that whilst in pursuit, you had Rose and Mickey trying to call Jackie, only to find she was too busy back-chatting her own daughter. This intensity, combined with Jackie proclaiming the end of the world because her daughters come home with a sick boyfriend just made for priceless humour. Even by the time the pair got back to the flat, the action only stopped because of the music. It bounced from heist music to calm familiar motifs and finally a singular ringing violin note that remained until the killer Christmas tree started spinning. There was just no room to breathe in this sequence. In truth, they are just aliens that caught the scent of the Doctor's sweet breath. Unfortunately, this tree's CGI hasn't aged particularly 
particularly well either, but it's the recurrence of the idea that a big green alien monster had invaded Jackie's home again that's made the insanity of this sequence so enjoyable. Coffee table destroyed, this also happened in the episode Rose. Mickey using a chair to defend Jackie, that happened in World War 3. The destruction of the set, the rotating prosthetic and rumbling doorframe all gave the encounter grit and realism. Even the fast paced music contrasted wonderfully with the danger our characters were in. The Doctor then got taken outside for some fresh air, but his regeneration hadn't quite finished yet. Jackie's hyperventilating response to the Doctor's pain was just outstanding. The way they worked her new boyfriend into the narrative with the apple and the dressing gown made a nice parallel with Rose and her new-ish boyfriend in the narrative. Why is that apple in my dressing gown? Oh, that's Howard. Sorry. Sorry. He keeps apples in his dressing gown. He gets hungry. What, you're hungry in his sleep? Sometimes. The story limited the Doctor by making him a bedridden sick boy. For this incarnation's first story, this was an interesting choice as it made his awake time that much more poignant and memorable in the story. I'm a big fan of the less is more concept and it can certainly be applied here. If alien dangers are coming and the humans will be the first to know about it, our protagonist isn't going to be around to save the day in his usual capacity. This ramped up the tension further. Unfortunately, the next scene was more of the characters just watching TV. Worse was seeing Mickey doing more of his hacking skills and seeing this ghastly pilot fish animation. Then we got the first proper appearance of Unit in the revival. I found it thoroughly amusing that all the top alien experts were operating in one of London's biggest tourist attractions. This MI5-esque introduction with black cars would be imitated to oblivion in future episodes of the show. Harriet's Jones in the flesh was a very welcome sight. The repeating joke that everyone knows who she is was absolutely marvellous. Even Torchwood would have a functional appearance for the very first time in the show. Little bit of trivia for those that don't know, Torchwood was the name given to the show whilst it was in production before 2005 to mask the fact Doctor Who was coming back to TV. Then Christmas got more chaotic once the blood possession idea started to control a large portion of the population. I probably found this idea fantastic and terrifying at the same time because I don't even know my own blood type. The cherry on the cake being that not even the Doctor can save the world because he's just as incapacitated as the A positives. To then turn this all into the greatest Christmas speech ever seen was just priceless comedy. Did we ask about the royal family? Oh. They're on the roof. I will say that her plea to the Doctor was a little strange, given that she knows Rose Tyler and no doubt would have sent intelligence operatives to the flat during the night. Even worse was that the Doctor is supposed to be one of Britain's best kept secrets. This was accompanied by some of the most unbelievable Billy Piper crying I've ever seen. The chocolate cake's gone. Sonic Wave! It's the spaceship! It's hit the atmosphere! Oh, jolly good old chap. Sadly, there was a fair amount of needless expository dialogue during this sequence, but I was rather impressed with how well the CGI rooftop and spaceship shots have aged. <laughs> Rose then took the initiative through desperation. Hiding her family in the TARDIS because she didn't have a choice was a far more interesting response than crying like a baby. Meanwhile, the four important humans in this story got squashed by the teleport and my goodness, the Sycorax just looked fantastic. The helmet itself looked amazing, but it was when they pulled it off that made for a great reveal. Our scientist character's optimism that they will look like humans was completely trodden on by this red-eyed face that looked like a horrific horrendous display of flesh and bone but in the wrong places. What a brutal species they proved to be as well. In spite of their futuristic ability to travel through space, their customs and lust for domination are practically medieval by human standards. Selling half the human race into slavery, blood voodoo, death whips, it was all fantastic stuff. The Sycorax then beamed up the TARDIS in the middle of tea time. Rose's poor attempts to negotiate were amusing whilst the wall of Sycorax 
Max hurt my eyeballs. I know it's super convenient that the smell of tea would wake the doctor up, but given all the other fantastical ideas that this episode had thrown at us for the past half hour, it's not too hard to accept, especially considering it directly affects the translation circuits. Hearing the terrifying Sycorax suddenly speak English tied into the doctor's line perfectly, given how he's directly responsible for making scary alien monsters not scary. <laughs> So uncivilized. Even more integrated was how the story once again addressed the audience's confusion about the Doctor's identity. They used other characters' dialogue to prompt an exploration of this new incarnation's personality. What happened to my Doctor? I literally asked the same thing at the end of Parting of the Ways when I was nine years old. It was here that we got some absolutely classic dialogue from the Doctor. Am I Ginger? I don't know! Tennant's brilliant delivery was accompanied by an aura of energy, reeling dialogue so fast that even the subtitles couldn't keep up. You know, that's all blood control is. Cheap bit of voodoo. It scares the pants off you, but that's as far as it goes. It's like hypnosis. You can hypnotise someone to walk like a chicken or sing like Elvis, you can't hypnotise them to death. It's how he makes his consonants and vowels explode with emphasis that made him so enticing. Blood control! I haven't seen blood control for years! Watch closely and see how the editor cuts just as he pronounces the word button. A great big threatening button. A great big threatening button button which must not be pressed under any circumstances, am I right? Even though he can spit out words faster than your favourite rapper, you understand each and every one. What a talented individual and what a showcase for episodes to come. All that from just giving Tennant the stage for five minutes. The climax of the whole scene was reached with a sword fight. It was probably the grandiosity of the score that took over from where Tennant began that made this sequence so enjoyable. It's not filmed particularly amazing amazingly though. Definitely not a fan of those slow motion shots or the fact the Doctor had his background changed when dialogue or special effects were needed. The stakes were what kept you on your toes to find out who's going to win. Hell, this would have made the perfect cliffhanger. <laughs> The regeneration cycle was used to get the Doctor a fat hand and win the duel. It was certainly interesting that we got another premonition of things to come here. When he had his no second chances bit, I was struck by the sight of him sending the family of blood to live out an eternity of never-ending suffering. This Satsuma-induced death seemed almost kind in comparison, but this duality of personality was another aspect that made Tennant such a cracking doctor. Now we come to the most unsettling aspect of the episode when Harriet Jones zapped the Sycorax to oblivion. This moment would appear to harken back to a rather controversial aspect of British history, the Falklands conflict that took place 23 years prior to this episode. This moment would seem to mirror a part of the conflict conflict when a light cruiser named General Belgrano was sunk, leading to the loss of 323 lives. Over half of the Argentinian lives that were taken in that conflict went down with that ship. The controversy was surrounding whether the ship was retreating from the islands or not, and whether that made it a legitimate target. Like the Sycorax ship leaving the Earth's atmosphere, the Doctor argued that attacking a retreating belligerent is not justified. Fireball. It's the condemnation of this action that is what sends this scene into the stratosphere quality-wise. With the Doctor's absence in this episode, it would seem like Harriet had a fairly good argument for her actions. From where I'm sitting though, it would seem that because the Doctor had taken the spotlight away from her, a little jealousy reared its ugly head. Given her refusal of American intervention seen earlier in the episode, her position of power might have gotten the better of her. The Doctor's judgement, delivered by Tennant, was so brilliant and intoxicating. I should have told them to run. 
as fast as they can, run and hide because the monsters are coming. The human race. Making us realize we humans are just as capable of genocide as the Sycorax. Don't challenge me, Harriet Jones. The doctor's six words would seem to send a shockwave in British politics. It's quite a nonsensical moment, but it seemed like the show was making a point about how people will re-elect political parties despite numerous scandals, and that we're more concerned about appearances and never displaying weakness than we are about what our leaders actually do and stand for. To truly contextualise the inevitable downfall of this Prime Minister, the camera moved away with Harriet trembling, then seen left in this car park from a distance. Don't you think she looks tiny? Then we had a montage of Christmas dinner. Seeing the Doctor getting changed in the TARDIS wardrobe made me sad because I always wondered about the other numerous rooms we never got to see in the TARDIS. What was most wonderful though was seeing the Doctor sitting and eating dinner with everyone, considering that was something Eccleston's incarnation would simply never do. The episode rounded off with this ash snow falling from the wreckage of the ship. White Christmases are so rare in England that seeing it left a bittersweet feeling, given that they could just blast aliens in the sky so their Christmases don't look so grey. Even the obviously fake large clumps of snow in our character's hair can be shrugged off precisely because it's not snow. The balance this episode was able to strike between the old and new was completed when the Doctor ended the episode with this huge thank you to Eccleston, who paved the way for such an excellent role. And it is going to be fantastic. So, did it suck? It's certainly one of the better Christmas specials. I'd even say it's a grand old time. It's got a few spots of aging and a few hiccups here and there, but nothing that can't fit in with the general routine of this show. This Christmas episode feels more bearable because of the characters, the tension, the humour and the music. It's the re-familiarisation with the Doctor and his identity that made for such an emotional experience. The bad guys were flipping fantastic in style and aggression and whenever Tennant appeared on screen the episode glowed like gold. I give The Christmas Invasion an 8 out of 10. Thanks for watching! Get early access to reviews like this one and exclusive access to others by making a pledge on my Patreon page. What do you think of this episode? Comment below your thoughts or join us for a chinwag on my Discord server where we'll continue this discussion. Merry Christmas everyone!